Federation and uh, thanks Phil and also the Tamil Congress who organized this event. Uh, mainly, I mean, I'm actually not only happy, I'm proud to be here. And I don't know whether I'm the only Sinhalese in this room. And I wish not. I hope not. And uh, it's a great, I mean, uh, privilege for me to be join this event and also to listen to this important presentation made by my co-panelist. And uh, most of the information that was shared today, except I think, uh, I mean, well, well, it was only Phil's uh, presentation. The information contained in uh, Phil's presentation was used as a background material mainly and uh, witness documents for the Raymond tri uh, Tribunal on genocide which happened in uh, 2013 December, uh, organized by the International Human Rights Association in Raymond. And actually the, the way it happened was actually because Phil is more efficient and more committed to the work he's doing, uh, the second part of the British complicity came out before the first part came out, which we did actually. So the, first, the second part is still with me, like this, and uh, it is uh, yet to be published, which we hope, like we hope in last year, uh, we'll hope to publish it as soon as possible. And uh, because of the time limitations, I will try to focus on a couple of issues, uh, mainly. And I was just thinking, when I was listening to Dr. Takriki, I was just... One, I mean, thinking that the information and the material that I have with me, even though it's 150 years ago, I mean, something to do with 200 years ago, there's a quite striking similarity and relevance to what actually the British did to uh, the, the people who lived in, uh, who were living in the island of Sri Lanka in the 19th century. Because everybody, I mean, whenever nobody, whenever I speak to uh, most of my Tamil friends, if I ask them, I mean, what do you think the source of uh, the genocidal policies of the state? The list would include mainly the Mahavamsa mindset. I would just explain what Mahavamsa means. Mahavamsa is the Bible of the Sinhalese, which uh, basically, I mean, uh, the written history of the Sinhalese, which they are quite proud of having. And we call it the Bible of Sinhalese because uh, everything is written there, not only about 2,500 years, but also about mother coming 2,500 years, according to the belief of the Sinhalese. And this Mahavamsa mindset is one source of this uh, genocidal policies, which justifies the genocidal policies. And the second thing is the unitary state. But if I ask them, from where did these two things come? Has it been there for 2,500 years, you think? Or was it some, something, someone invented it? So when I was listening to Dr. Takrik, I was thinking, the divisions that British actually implemented, imposed on this, uh, the people who were living in the island, was exactly while consolidating, while creating a unitary state which was not there earlier, they made sure that the people who lived in that island will stay divided. So that was the important aspect of their policy towards Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as they said. To make sure, because the, I mean, the Sinhalese and the Tamils have been living there for a long time, nobody knows how, how long, probably more than 2,000 years. The two national formations basically, I will, I mean, while I'm talking, I will read out some of the important parts of the document. Uh, the two national formations share territory and cultural heritage. As a result of, uh, and as a result, one can find overlapping histories, territories and dual allegiances. In some board areas, Tamils and Sinhala kings shared sovereignty, while there was also struggle between the kingdoms, kingdoms for power and control. Now this has been the way of life before the Western penetration uh, began in the 15th century, or 16th century actually. And the thing is, so when I, when I ask a Tamil friend, from where did the United State came, where, where, from where did it come, and from where did the, the Sinhala mindset, the Mahavamsa became the dominant way of thinking about their past, how did, how did the Sinhala start thinking about their past in terms, um, in terms given in Mahavamsa? Nobody knows actually, none of the Tamil people, Tamil friends I have, knew where it came from. It actually came from the British. I mean, if not, if the animosities have been running that far, how could the last single kingdom ruled by, I mean, for, ruled for 200 years by Tamil kings imported from India? I say imported because there were no single kings at a certain point of time. I mean, they, they lost all the kings. They had, they, I mean, the last king didn't have a child. So therefore, they had to import a king, and the first king was imported from India in the last 200 years until the whole island was fell under the British control. It was controlled the 200 years. There were four Tamil kings. And if the animosities had been so deep, how could the Sinhalese, the so-called Sinhala population, tolerated 
then being ruled by a Tamil king who considered as a historical enemy. Now that was actually the inter invention happened in 19th century. Now the British colonial, the process of British colon uh, the colonization uh, of uh, the island of Sri Lanka started, I mean ba basically it, it achieved its goal through mainly through uh, working through main, uh, three, three main areas actually. One was actually the creating the unity state. It's basically this, I mean, redemarcating the, uh, the geographical territory and bringing all the parts of the country, parts of the island, unto, uh, under one single political control and one single military control. Now that was, the, that was done actually in three stages. First it was legally uh, uh, achieved through the 18, I mean there was, a, there was a, uh, agreement signed between the British crown and the Sinhala uh, aristocrats handing over the, the entire island and the control, control of the island to the British where it was legally for the first time mentioned the whole island will become uh, a part of Indian, I'm oh, sorry, uh, British Empire. And that was a legal document that laid the basis for the unitary state. And in the next 10 years actually what happened was because the native islanders resisted, they rebelled against the British crown, what they did was actually, in order to, I mean, apart from crushing the, uh, all the rebellions, what they did basically, they understood they were in a kind of, I mean, disadvantageous position because the rebels had an upper hand because they knew the ground, they knew the territory, they knew how to move around. And because of that, even though they succeeded in crushing the uh, uprisings, they knew within the next 10 years, they have to make sure the strategic upper hand, they should have the strategic upper, upper hand inside the island. So what they did was, they constructed a huge network of roads, rail uh, tracks, in order to make sure that if another uprising happens, they, they are able to crush it within, uh, not, not in months, but in days. That was the main thing from 1820 to 1830. The main British project was to construct roads, uh, connecting the coastal areas of the island uh, with the central uh, uh, part of the island. And that increased the mobility of the British troops if, the, if there's a need arises. And then the third thing, that strategic uh, uh, unification, the legal unification, and the third uh, stage was actually the administrative unification. Administrative unification was achieved through the 1833, the famous Colbrook Cameron reforms, uh, the British appointed commission to look into the, uh, well, they said the needs of the islanders. And as a result of this uh, commission, the commission basically uh, divided the country into five administrative uh, areas. And the thing is, when everybody asked why Sri Lanka was, I mean, I mean, why the island of Ceylon or island of Sri Lanka was uh, brought into one single unit, everybody thinks it's for the administrative convenience. Forgetting the fact, they didn't have to do that to control the vast Indian empire, but they had to do that. I mean, there were administrative inconveniences, we were told. In this small tiny island they couldn't do without unifying the country. So which means actually there was another, another agenda why they actually needed to unify. It's not for administrative conveniences but actually it was for the strategic convenience of the British. Why the colonial, the colonizing project of, uh, the, uh, project, um, the colonizing process of the island was not, cannot be understood. It cannot be understood within the context of the island. The British didn't come because Sri Lanka was quite attractive because we had elephants and because we had beaches. The reason British came because Ceylon was in the middle of an important sea route and geographical proximity to India. If India wasn't there, they wouldn't have come to Sri Lanka. Because of India, Sri Lanka became colonized and Sri Lanka was seen as one of the most important colonial position of the British Empire. According to I will quote what they said actually about the colonizing process. This is how we how uh, it was said, okay. according, to, I mean, according to the uh, colonial documents, India, Britain's most valuable position, its jewel in the crown, became covered a territory greater than that of Roman Empire. The need for the British to define, defend its rule in India from external as well as internal enemies heightened the importance of the island of Sri Lanka not only because of his location on the top of the sea route, but also because of his close proximity to India, as, internet, uh, as mentioned before. And the thing is, this is how they worded the importance of Sri Lanka. They said, it, India is the largest, most populous and most important of a Britannic, uh, Britannic Majesty's crown colonies. Now this is written by 
a person called John Ferguson, who was a proper writer and editor of the Ceylon Observer, which is considered as the mouthpiece or the official organ of the colonial government, published in Colombo. Now, according to his words, he says, India is the largest, most populous, and most important of her Britannic Majesty's Crown colonies, which are so-called because the administration of their affairs is under the direct control of the colonial office. Ceylon has long been confessed the best and brightest gem in Britain's Orient this day. So great was value attached to Ceylon as the key of India that at the general peace, Britain chose to give up Java to the Dutch and retain this little island so inferior in area, population, natural resources. So it has nothing to do with resources, it has nothing to do with population or the area, but it has everything to do with where it was. That was the whole reason the British came. I always think, when I say this, I always think about uh, our dear friend and the legendary journalist Sivaram, who always kept on saying, unfortunately, Tamils live in a most important area. And it has been a most important area even 200 years ago. Because according to the, I mean, according to the documents, where when the dealings were done between the British and the other colonial, competing colonial powers like Dutch and the French, Britain and the British administrative officers who actually, I mean, who handled the uh, negotiations were strictly instructed by the British colonial office. Uh, I will quote the words instead of I mean, saying it. This is what they said actually to the British uh, uh, the people who handled the negotiations, the colonial office said, and the governor, Frederick North, who was the British administrator of the maritime provinces of Ceylon, he was writing the colonial office, basically sharing his opinions about how the negotiations with the uh, French should be uh, done. And he says, should European complications and indifferent success necessitate partition with the Dutch, the North and the East, the North and the East should be retained with the British. If you are going to basically partition the country, make sure North and East stays with us. And that treaty should, in, the ca in that case, be offered again to Kandy, at your objects will be entirely political, not financial or commercial. Because they want to say that, okay, you can have the rest of the island, we don't need it. But if, you have, if there's anything that happened to, I mean, if, if they are aiming at anything through the, through the negotiations, that was to retain North and Eastern part of the country. And that North and Eastern part of the country is what Sivaram kept on saying, unfortunately, Tamils. And we know what it, how unfortunate it is, in a certain sense, when we look up 200 years, the outcome, what happened in, the, in these areas. And say, I mean, how much time I have? Ten minutes, okay. Well, I'm going to do like 100 years of history in 10 minutes. <laughs> So the important thing, one of the important things that we need to understand when understanding the conflict, when understanding the, the historical, I mean, the causes that caused, I mean, the, the reasons that caused the conflict, is the context, the colonized, the, 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 the context where, uh, the, the context that the British were interested. It was not the island, but it was the Indian subcontinent context. And where, hence the process of unification of the island of Ceylon, the unification of the island of Ceylon, needs to be understood within this important subcontinental con context as the process was entirely governed by empire's strategic necessities of the day rather than administrative or commercial priorities within the island as many would by, like to believe. So the thing is, if the unification was done on the strategic purposes, considering the strategic conveniences, so the, but the problem was, there was a, another problem that the British was facing at that time, the problem was the increasing tensions inside India. Now, the important wealth was India, the most important wealth was India, and in, in, when India get destabilized because of the uprisings, they need to have a solid, uh, they need to have a solid uh, strategic post where they could observe, monitor, and control anything that is happening in India. But the problem was, there was a connection, apart from the geographical I mean, proximity, that despite the geographical proximity actually, there was a problem they are facing because the islanders, the natives who were living in the island, had a connection to India. They had a linguistic connection. They had a, I mean, kind of, I mean, uh, uh, they were, more, I mean, both communities who were living in uh, in the island were claimed to be descendants of the people who were, who came from India. So because of that, they had to make sure while unifying the country to make sure that the divide and rule policy was applied not directly to the people who were living in the island. The divide and rule policy was applied, dividing Ceylon, dividing the island politically from Indian influence. 
because at that time Indian influence mean, meant something completely different from what we would say now the Indian influence. Because at that time the Indian influence would mean it would stir up the anti-British feelings, anti-colonial feelings inside the island and destabilize the British control, not only in the island, not only in India, in the entire Indian subcontinental region. So therefore what they was I mean what they did actually to make sure while unifying the country, they wanted to destroy any kind of connection the people in the country would have with Indians. Because this was created, this, this priority was given by a specific reason, because 50 years before the official, uh, according to official, 50 years before the Indian anti-British uprising started, there were uprisings in the southern part of India, which is known as Poliga uprisings, that was, a, that was that the condition, uh, considered as the uh, first uh, uprisings against the British uh, East India Company. And that had a huge effect on the people who were living in the Indian, uh, the South Indian part of the, part of India. And the problem was, the people who were living in the North and Eastern part of the island spoke the same language just as the people who were rebelling against the Indians. They share the same, more or less, they share the same cultural values just like the people who were living across the Bay of Bengal. So the problem was, how, because the connection between the Tamils who were living in the island and the Tamils who were living in the Indian, the southern Indian uh, 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 area, it was a live connection because they spoke the same language. It was not like saying that, okay, we came from that area, but now we have given up the language, now we have given up the religion, but we are now completely, uh, I mean, become a completely different kind of uh, community. It, it was not like that. The connection was quite live, unlike the connection the Sinhalese had with India. According to the Sinhala kind of history, even though we came from India, within within the, the like thousand years or some uh, period, the language changed, and we I mean we were we, we became Buddhist mostly, and religion wise we had no connection to India because Buddhism has completely uh, I mean uh, we, I mean basically I mean it's uh, disappeared from Indian uh, uh, Indian I mean, areas where the Buddhism was predominantly earlier seen. The problem was actually, so they understood, they looked at Sinhalese as a minority, not as a majority. They looked at the Sinhalese as a minority because Sinhalese fit into a category that normally we know that when British control a country and when they are leaving, they leave the power with the minority. And in Sri Lanka, everybody thinks, okay, they left the power with the majority, therefore the whole problem started. But actually what they did was they never changed their policy. They left the power with minority, which in this case, the Sinhalese. Because they, we were the minority in the Indian subcontinental context. We were minority in linguistic terms, we were minority in religious terms, and we had no connection. We, were, we had a feeling like we were surrounded by uh, people who are not speaking our language, who, uh, who don't believe our religion, so we are a minority. So that provided conditions that, we, that British could exploit to use them as a loyalist population. As a loyalist population, to further their interest in the region, using and increasing the fears they had naturally. But the problem was how to divide the connection they had with the Tamil people who live inside the island. I forget about the people who live across the Bay of Bengal, but how to divide them from the connections, live connections they had with the people who are living, the Tamil people who are living inside the island. For that they needed to construct a new national consciousness, which is we call now the Sinhala Buddhist consciousness. The Sinhala Buddhist consciousness was not a 2,000 years old thing. It was 200 years old. It was constructed as a part of the British colonial project. It was constructed mainly through main three fields. One was the historiography, rewriting and reinterpreting history of Sinhalese. And the two, it's archaeological excavations and reordering the geographical spaces, favoring the Sinhalese, saying the, uh, the, the, the un, I mean, everything that was unearthed Glory, glory, uh, glorious uh, civilization, it belongs to the Sinhalese. And so the archaeological excavations, unlike in India, India they did not, I mean normally, not, not, not only in India, British didn't spend huge amount of money to uh, uncover how glorious the colonial subjects were, you know, how glorious did they live before we came. It was not the British practice. But in Sri Lanka, in this island, they did that. They spent huge amount of money in the, within the I mean, 19th century period, establishing institutions to ex I mean, carry out archaeological excavations in order to construct the history of the Sinhalese and to interpret it 
as Sinhalese as the original owners of this civilization, while the Tamils are the invading powers who actually destroyed this civilization. So what happened as a result of it? The Mahavamsa, for example, the Bible of the Sinhalese, were not known to the Sinhalese until 1865. It was not known to the ordinary Sinhalese because it was written in Pali. Pali is a language you don't speak Pali normally. It's a written language and at the same time, Pali is a I mean, language of the scholars. It is only used by certain scholars who, can, who have the capability. So it was written in Pali. It was completely insignificant and uh, uh, insignificant document that was ignored by many because they didn't know about it. It was found by a British administrative officer, a colonial officer, who accidentally, I mean, he accidentally found it in a temple lying around, and he then took it, and he then start, started translating it to English. So interestingly, even though it has become our Bible, Mahavamsa didn't have a single translation before an English translation was done. So it, was, it, came, it came as a Pali thing, and it was translated into English, and then 30 years after that, the British governor to Sri Lanka said, why don't you translate it to Sinhala? Because it is the Sinhalese who should read it. Because according to Mahavansa narrative, the most important civilizational period was not during the time the British destroyed us, British colonized us, but it was thousand years ago, a civilization that existed like uh, 4th BC, from 4th BC to 10th AD or something. And that was a civilization that was actually destroyed with the invasions of the South Indian kings. So it was an ideal thing that Sinhalese look at their past through Mahavansa, through the window of Mahavansa, in order to find a new enemy. While living under the British colonial boot, we found a new enemy that was the invading Tamils who are still living in this country. So we sided with the British and British gave us a feeling that you are Ardrens. And Ardren theory is also an important theory because it didn't, now sorry, the Sinhalese for example now strongly believe that they are Ardren. They are Ardren in racial, in racial sense. Even though it's not a racial kind of thing, but it has been used to, I mean, convince the Sinhalese, they are complete, they are not only different from religion, they are not only different from language, but you are completely a different kind of people. They are completely belong to a different kind of family, because you are Aryans and they are Dravidians. The Tamils doesn't, I mean, they don't have anything common with you. Actually, you have more common things with us. That's what British said to the Sinhalese. I mean, because I cannot quote all the documents because of the time limitations. Sorry to finish that. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so it's already. And the thing is that, I mean, the British convinced the Sinhalese, you are more close to us. I mean, we are masters and you are our subjects, of course, true. But when we go to the past, you are more close to us and we are proud of having brothers like you because we have a great history just like ours. And when we look at it, it was actually the Dravidians who destroyed this important civilization. And we are trying to restore this civilization for you. And they did it through historiographical work. And they did it through archaeological excavations. And they did it by reinterpreting the entire uh, geographical spaces where they claim the most, I mean, the, the heart of the singular civilization. And as a result of it, now we started 19th century without knowing anything about Mahavansa, without knowing anything about this destroyed and buried uh, civilizations. But we entered 20th century thinking that this was the most important, uh, I mean, heritage, the most important legacy that we have to protect, not from the British, but from the Tamil invaders. Now, this was a construct, that is why, I mean, I thought, I mean, when I was listening to you, I was thinking how they divided the country, which didn't exist before 19th century. That racial, I mean, animosities along the lines of ethnic identity was never existed. The fighting and the wars we had was completely connected to the kingdoms that we lived under. It was bit, uh, king, uh, wars between kingdoms. So, I mean, because of the time limitations, I have, I have to stop there, even though I have well, quite a lot of material. And I would like to uh, contribute uh, whichever way, that, uh, I mean, uh, depending on the questions and uh, the suggestions you have at the discussion. Thank you very much.